Jeff Magnuson, I, I head up the um, data platform architecture group at Netflix. Um, and so the, the way that you can think of our, our, our team at Netflix is, um, you know, we kind of sit on top of the Hadoop and big data, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, on top of the Hadoop and big data infrastructure um, and, and, and design tools and services that make that infrastructure as, as easy to use and um, as efficient to use as possible. Um, and so Lipstick is one of those tools that we wrote. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about you know, the uh, Netflix data architecture in general tonight as well. Um, and I've been told that this uh, meetup is pretty uh, in interactive. So you know, please interrupt with questions. I love questions. Um, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll see where that gets us. So um, I think one of the coolest things about Lipstick is the logo. <laughs> <laughs> Feature that right there. It was actually drawn by the um, uh, creative lead for um, Netflix Kids, so I, I can't take too much credit for it, but um, uh, I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of just went over this, but the, the motivation for, for our team is to make our big data um, as accessible and easy to use and efficient to, to use as, as possible for you know, everybody across the organization. Um, and you know, when we think about everybody, it, it doesn't just include engineers and it doesn't just include analysts. Um, and really, you know, the, the employees at Netflix usually fall somewhere within a spectrum of analyst to engineer. Um, and so, you know, those kinds of people have um, two very different wants. And so, you know, you think about people who are analysts, they don't, they don't really care about um, the technology underneath the data or um, how, how everything runs. They really just want um, you know, an, an easy um, I I interface into to querying it and finding out, you know, what, what they want to find out. Um, and they want, you know, that to run fast and without, you know, any kind of technical headache. Um, the engineers, on the other hand, you know, they're, they're you know, hard at work on um, some piece of the Netflix infrastructure and they want to, to integrate, you know, big data with, with whatever they're, you know, currently writing. And so, you know, they, they want um, a rich API layer that they can plug into um, that's going to give them, you know, the ability to, to integrate big data with whatever their application is. So you can think about, you know, the kinds of stuff that Netflix, Netflix would do with big data. Um, you know, it feeds our algorithms, which is, you know, uh, uh, something that we like to think is a mighty part of, you know, our value proposition. Um, it, it does things like fraud detection, um, you know, the, Tons of, of um, applications use our data, and, and we want to make that as easy as possible for engineers to be able to plug into. Um, so, you know, as a, a data architecture team, you know, we have to interface a lot with um, the, the the analysts. We interface a lot with the engineers. Um, there's very few of us that build this this platform, and so we want one you know base platform that's going to you know meet everybody's needs and expectations. Um, so. Uh, one, you know, super unique thing about the Netflix architecture that, you know, kind of stands apart from other companies is we're not in a data center. Um, Netflix is pretty well known for running their entire infrastructure on AWS, um, and Hadoop is no different. And so before I start talking about Libstack or any of the tools that we've built on top of Hadoop, um, I think that, you know, it, it will put them in a lot more context if I just talk a little bit about what our architecture is in general. Um, and so one of the, the chief differentiating factors of the Netflix architecture versus a traditional data center Hadoop deployment is that we use S3 as the source of truth for all of our um, big data. Um, and so you know, while our clusters all run um, HDFS, it's not used to store um, any source of truth information. So um, you know, think about you know, you write a, a hive or pig job and it, it compiles into five MapReduce jobs, they're going to persist intermediate results on HDFS. Um, but, you know, the, the source and the sync for those jobs is always going to be S3. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's pretty great for us um, in that it decouples our storage from our processing um, resources. 
So you know, you can think of S3 as essentially this giant, infinite hard drive in the cloud that's you know super reliable. Um, we don't have to worry about um, any kind of single point of failure with HDFS, um, name node, anything like that. Um, on the downside, you know, it decouples our processing from our storage, so there's no such thing as locality anymore. Um, and so, you know, every time we go out and, and you know, talk about our architecture, we, we always get the question of, um, you know, how, how can this even be usable? Um, it seems, you know, that locality is such an important part of um, Hadoop in general that, um, you know, without HDFS and, and with S3, it's just not going to work well. And so from all of our benchmarking on um, a production kind of workload, you know, with these long-running scripts that um, source from S3 and then put intermediate results in HDFS and sync to S3, um, you know, what we found is that we're hitting, you know, maybe a 10% um, penalty for, for doing that. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not significant enough that, that we feel it outweighs the benefits of, of running on S3. And so kind of some stats about the kind of data that we're um, sourcing in. We get, we get um, basically two different sources. Um, the vast majority of the data is coming um, is logging event data um, through a log collection pipeline. We use um, uh, something called Hanu for that, which is a deeply, deeply customized version of Chukwu, which is in the open source. Um, uh, Chukwu stands for turtle, I think, so does Hanu, and, and we're looking at reopen sourcing it. Um, is some other word for turtle that I can't think of right now. But um, uh, that, that's the majority of our data. It's event fact-based data. Um, to add context to that data, um, we want to dig into our stateful data stores to um, you know, figure out, um, say, say an event is that customer five streamed movie or downloadable asset three you know, at a certain time um, at a certain bit rate, right? Um, that, that's kind of boring. Really what we want to know is some information about our downloadable asset three and our customer five. Um, and that information is all in our stateful data stores, which is primarily Cassandra at Netflix. Um, so we have another data acquisition pipeline, which is, is smaller, but um, in certain ways a little trickier. Um, out of Cassandra, basically we consume um, incrementally data um, from Cassandra as it's created. Um, we've built an app for that called Agathis, which um, if you can figure out how to spell it and Google for it. Um, there's some uh, blog entries about that that talk a little bit more about how it works. But um, all in all, you know, it's mostly events that we're consuming. We get around 100 billion events a day, which is you know pretty fun scale to play with. Um, and you know, we usually persist that raw data for around 90 days. Um, and so, you know, all told, it, it's you know a, a few petabytes of data that we've got on S3 available to query. Um, uh, on our Hadoop clusters at any given time. So, you know, on top of that, we're, we're running a bunch of Hadoop clusters um, on, Sorry. yep. Sorry. All right, so on, on top of S3, we're running multiple Hadoop clusters, which is a benefit of being decoupled from um, our, our storage layer. You know, we can run multiple Hadoop clusters against the same, um, you know, storage set. Um, and so you might think, you know, part of the promise of, of um, Hadoop is that it should have good enough process scheduling that you shouldn't have to do that, right? Um, you should just be able to run a giant Hadoop cluster and, um, you know, everything is decoupled and isolated enough that everything is going to perform. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, we, we found that isn't the case. There, there is a benefit to being able to run um, our production jobs in a, in a separate cluster of our Wild West cluster that we call the, the query cluster. Um, and so kind of the, the separation there between our two main clusters is we've got this um, batch workflow that runs every night. Um, we know the characteristics of it. We know, you know what's scheduled in there, and we can kind of predict demand. So um, uh, we, we schedule our you know, important SLA jobs on that cluster. We have a, a, a query cluster that anybody can submit jobs to at any time. There's really no rules to what they can do. Um, and so you know, we want to keep you know, that kind of isolation um, of do whatever you want from, you know, do what needs to be done. Um, and so we, we have two long running clusters, one that's for whatever you want, one that's for production. Um, and part of, of um, you know, what we've been able to do by being so decoupled is um, we, we steal excess capacity from engineering at, at night when people are asleep and not streaming movies. And so we stand up um, some bonus clusters at night that, that we, um, 
uh, transition uh, workflow traffic onto when they're up and shut them down at like six in the morning when we need capacity back. So, um, you know, multiple Hadoop clusters running is pretty elastic because of those bonus clusters when we're stealing um, siphoning capacity from the rest of our engineering resources. Um, but, you know, all told, it's, it's a little over 2,000 instances running at any given time and it can expand, you know, I think it's, it's uh, elastic by around 800 nodes right now. Um, but, you know, having multiple Hadoop clusters, you can think, becomes pretty confusing for users having to provision them for three hours at, at, at night just to run some production workflow on top of and then shut them down. Um, it creates a pretty complex um, back-end infrastructure. And, you know, that's fine as long as the complexity is buying us um, an, an appropriate gain. But definitely as a team, one of the things that we want to do is, you know, one, make that as automated as possible for us, but two, shield our end users from that kind of complexity, right? So ideally, um, to an end user, there should just be a um, interface that you can submit a, a MapReduce job to, um, and, and it's going to give you your results back. So you shouldn't have to know that there's a production and a query cluster. You should definitely not have to know that um, 25 minutes ago we spun up a bonus cluster from, from um, uh, you know, excess engineering capacity. So we built this RESTful interface on top of, you know, this, you know, multiple Hadoop cluster environment. Um, and we open sourced it uh, at Hadoop Summit, what was it, in, in June. Um, so not very long ago, but um, you can check out that project. We call it Genie. We call it Genie because it grants three wishes as long as those wishes are running a Hadoop job, a Hive job, or a pig job. Um, but it's at github.com slash Netflix slash Genie. Um, and, you know, I know that the uh, author of, of Genie would love some contributions. So if you're interested in that, um, come and talk to me. So the question is, when you say Hadoop clusters, are these like similarly um, running clusters or like the EMR, uh, classic MapReduce? So uh, it, it, the, the question is, um, are they permanently running clusters or are they transient um, EMR workflows? And the answer is they're kind of both. Um, we do run the EMR distribution of Hadoop, but we don't run them as um, uh, traditional EMR workflows. We, we treat them as semi-permanent semi clusters, right? So they're transient in the, in the sense that um, if, if the query cluster or the production cluster were to go down, which they sometimes do, um, we, we don't see it as a, a big deal, you know, we just spin up a new one. Um, but we don't want those clusters to go down. You know, there, there are a lot of instances that are running long-running jobs. Um, uh, we certainly don't want to spin up a new Hadoop cluster for every workflow that we want to run through our system. It takes too long to spin up the instances. Um, you know, you're paying for partial instance hours. You know, there's a lot of reasons not to do it. So um, they are EMR um, clusters, but we, we run so many jobs per day, which I'll talk about in a little bit here, but um, we run so many jobs per day that they're pretty much always peaked at capacity and we just keep them up, so. So on top of um, our EMR clusters, we've built you know, Genie um, and uh, two other services, so the, the lot of the three of those I like to call our primitive services um, that you know, we're, we're building the rest of our applications and architecture on top of. So, you know, obviously being able to run your jobs is very important. Um, we also see, you know, is equally important the ability to discover um, all of your data across the organization. So we have a metadata store named Franklin that um, uh, basically abstracts, you know, all of our other sources of truth for, for metadata um, into a homogenous API to get to that data. Um, and we have something that we call the event service, which basically manages orchestration um, of everything that's gone on in the architecture. So it's kind of a, a history journal of um, uh, jobs and events and important things that have happened um, across the architecture. So it's, it's actually a pretty simple API that we don't really govern um, uh, a, a lot of the, the use of, but, you know, basically it's, it's a, the idea behind it is to record, you know, what's going on so you can orchestrate, you know, when to kick off your next thing. Um, so, you know, the, the scale of this is that we run thousands of jobs a day. Um, I'm honestly not sure the, the exact number, um, but at any given time, our architecture is managing around 100 MapReduce jobs that are running. 
Um, and so you can kind of you know, do the math in your head of what the scale of that is. It, it's big. Um, actually, you probably can't do it in your head because I can't. But um, it, it's a lot of jobs that we're running every day. Um, on top of those three primitive services, we've built a, a variety of other tools. Um, and so this is the space where Lipstick fits in, um, which is our you know, workflow monitoring um, visualization development tool. Um, uh, in addition to that, we have um, Ignite, which is kind of an AB analytics um, uh, tool, um, Spock for data auditing, uh, Forklift for data movement, you know, inspired by Crane from Twitter. Um, we thought Forklift, I, I don't know. Um, Looper for, for kind of backloading jobs, so a use case that we um, saw around Netflix quite a bit is that people wanted to run um, you know, the same job 50 times for different date ranges to fill tables in. And so we just kind of created an a API for that. Um, and Sting, which is kind of our um, uh, ad hoc visualization tool that takes um, Hadoop jobs, um, pins them into memory, and allows you to do really fast OLAP style um, aggregations against it. So, um, you know, one of the, the, the important thing about, you know, everything in this architecture is that it's, you know, highly decoupled. Um, every tool is good at one thing, and it, it's not, um, you know, coupled to, to any of the other tools. So, you know, very um, uh, decoupled architecture. Also, you know, we, we follow um, that kind of design principle when we're, when we're building the tools themselves. So typically, they're a RESTful API um, with a decoupled JavaScript front end sitting on top of them. And, and you'll see, you know, that's how um, Lipstick is developed, is, you know, decoupled as possible. Um, and it's how all of these tools are developed in, in general. And that, that pattern's worked really well for us. Um, you know, a lot of our tools have a JavaScript front end, but, um, you know, a lot of times we, we, you know, like to say it's just a reference GUI, right? Like if somebody else wanted to create a new, um, graphing tool on top of Sting, you know, Sting at its core is an API for doing fast in memory um, aggregation. It's not a, a visualization tool at heart, right? So um, all of that is as decoupled as we can make it. Um, so, you know, this is something that I anticipate questions about, but, um, you know, Lipstick um, for Pig is, um, you know, what, what I really want to talk about today. But um, you know, we, we also use Hive in our architecture. So you know, a lot of Pig, a lot of Hive. Um, people are free to do ETL and, and their data develop in whatever language they see most fit to do it in. Um, but typically, you know, our guidance to them and what we see people doing is um, you know, any kind of like one-off ad hoc query is going to be in Hive. Like it's really easy to think in SQL, um, especially if you're an analyst and you've been writing SQL for 20 years. Um, it's just what you want to write. And naturally, you know, even me as an engineer who doesn't love SQL, if I have a question of the data um, that I'm going to ask one time, usually I just write a SQL query and it's really easy, right? So, um, you know, that, that's a sweet spot that we see for Hive. Um, also, you know, uh, lightweight aggregations that we do hourly or daily um, are, are easy to express and they're efficient in Hive and, you know, with some of that, some of that happens. Um, with Pig, we use it to express our complex data flows in ETL. Um, so, you know, I, I see Pig as being good at uh, a couple things. One, it's a little more declarative. It's procedural. Um, it, it's it's generating a DAG, right? Whereas um, SQL is is more functional. It's hard to um, create multiple um, forks in a data flow. You can't really um, define what is actually logically happening. You're 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 um, totally coupled, coupled to a compiler to figure out, you know, how your job is going to be um, structured and, and flow. Um, and so typically, you know, for, for big complicated workflows, um, uh, people are using Pig because, you know, one, it's a simple language to write MapReduce jobs in, but two, um, it's a little um, more, um, it, it, it gives the, the users a little more control to define exactly how their job is going to compile and how, how things are going to work. So, you know, when we're running these things um, every day for the next three years, you know, it's an algorithm to compute some kind of recommendation. Um, we want that to be efficient and well-tuned, and Pig gives us a chance to well-tune it. Um, so for people who aren't familiar with Pig, it's um, a data flow language. Um, so it's 
simple to learn. There's very few reserved words. Um, it's kind of comparable to if, if you've ever used um, like an explain tool in SQL that generates the logical plan about you know what's going to happen in, in, in your SQL language. It's kind of like running a, um, a or writing a logical plan um, for SQL. So you can think of it as being slightly more complex, um, but giving you slightly more control. Um, it's easy for us to extend and op optimize as a, a Hadoop team. Um, one, one of the reasons for that is that PIG is um, a completely client-side tool. So um, we can actually run multiple versions of PIG against our clusters. Um, and we can you know, re recompile, rebuild um, to try to fix bugs and you know, test that out without um, you know, um, doing redeployments to our clusters and, and having to muck with a lot of pain. So um, it's a little easier to develop on as an infrastructure team, and it's also you know decent for our engineers to develop on as um, the uh, ETL development team, and that they can write um, you know uh, macros in the pig language. They can write um, all kinds of um, UDFs and Java, Ruby, Python, um, JavaScript. I don't know what else it supports. Honestly, we use um, a lot of Java UDFs. Um, are less technical people that are writing UDFs typically do them in, in Python, um, and that's worked well for us so far. So, um, This is just an example of what PIG looks like if you've never seen it. Um, it's, it, it if, if you can read the slide from where you're sitting, um, you can see you know there's very few reserved words. I tried to bold them all. Um, uh, it's not super verbose, so this is word count. It's but like 10 lines, um, probably about as long as a SQL query would be. And if, if you write SQL, you can recognize kind of a lot of the same um, constructs and, and you know, um, syntax as, as writing a SQL statement. So um, you know, this, is, this is a kind of reference um, hello world script. But you know, that doesn't really um, you know, give a justification for the reason for investing in writing you know, what Lipstick is, which is a way to make development easier. You know, if you're seeing this, you might think you know, development is, is already easy. Why, why make it you know, even easier than this? But the reality of PIG um, is that, oh man, that's dark. But um, the reality of PIG is that you know, it's, it's not quite that simple when you're trying to do complex things. And so um, you know, even though our engineers aren't having to write Java MapReduce code, um, you know, they, they are having to express some pretty complex logic. And, and so what the screen is supposed to show is kind of a blurred out um, fragment of, you know, a, about 500 lines of, of pig script that generates one of our more complex workflows in Netflix. Um, and so y even if it was clear, you wouldn't really be able to see it. But um, uh, you would see a lot, a lot of syntax highlighting in there, tons of reserved words, um, kind of a funky structure. And you can imagine, you know, when you have 500 lines of anything, especially when that 500 lines is trying to express a DAG, um, it's pretty impossible to keep straight in your head how data is flowing through operations. Um, and especially, you know, even if you're a Hadoop expert, you know, it's not super intuitive how, you know, that much data and, and transformation is compiling into MapReduce, which is something that's important to understand if you're looking at optimizing it. So, you know, PIG, easy to express your data flows. Um, it gives you the advantage of being able to, um, you know, logically group your, your DAG operations um, into, into portions that don't necessarily, um, you know, flow with the order of execution of your data, right? So, for example, uh, one of the patterns I like to tell people at Netflix is put all of your um, load statements at the top of the script, put all of your store statements at the bottom of the script. But in reality, you know, data might be loaded um, for, for one path through your DAG um, transformed and stored before you know, data is even loaded for you know, the other half. Right? So um, you know, you're logically grouping like operations because it's easier to read and, and figure out what the heck's going on with the script when you have to maintain it. But um, as far as being able to figure out what the script is doing from a MapReduce perspective, it, it makes it even more difficult. So um, uh, you know, it's, it, that, that kind of abstraction makes it easy to skip operations, uh, overlook errors. Um, and you know, what we found is that visualization of those scripts make it really easy to um, you know, see all that information that you're lacking. And so 
you know, basically the history of this is I was trying to, to figure out how to better support people because, you know, we're an engineering team, but we're also, you know, part of the infrastructure. Um, and so a common, you know, thing that our analysts will bring to us is my pig script is slow, right? And, you know, that sucks for me to get that question because, you know, especially if it's as complicated as the one on the last slide, you know, the first thing I have to understand in order to, to try to optimize their script is, well, what does it do, right? And then I'm treated to like this hour-long explanation of, you know, the business context of what their script does, which is awesome, you know, but, um, you know, it's still, it's still hard to keep straight. And then I've got to read their code, I've got to figure it out. Honestly, if, um, you know, our analysts could support themselves and figure out why their script was slow, um, they don't have to explain what it's doing for an hour, they're happier. I'm happier because I get to write code instead of um, writing pig. And so we wrote Lipstick, you know, is kind of just a tool to figure out, you know, what, what the heck their scripts do, right? And so um, the history of it is that, that initially it was a Jython program that I could just run against a pig script when it was emailed to me and I would get kind of a picture of how it compiles into MapReduce. Um, and that was really easy to write, surprisingly. Um, and you know, as I was going through it, we found that it, it was, it was um, great for us as a team. We could, you know, run, run these scripts through. We would figure out, you know, what's going on. A lot of the times, um, you know, we would spot the error in a couple of minutes and, and go on our merry way, and it saved us a lot of pain. So we wanted to productionize this as a tool that goes to, you know, every script that ever runs in our architecture, archives it into this nice graphical format. Um, and saves all the metadata about the execution into one place, you know, that, that people can look at and interact with and, and use to, to write better, better scripts, um, develop faster, um, you know, be, be more productive folk. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of what uh, the DAGs that we generate through Lipstick um, look like. Um, Lipstick runs on Apache Pig uh, 11 plus, so, um, we, we actually run a, a version of 11 that we cherry pick um, patches from trunk um, back into. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it runs on 12 as well. I haven't compiled it against trunk for a while, but if it doesn't work, it's easy to get to work and it is open source. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it would be that hard. Um, uh, at, at Netflix, at this point, I tried to get the numbers today. We've run, um, well over 25,000 jobs um, on Lipstick. Um, so it's pretty battle tested. There's, there's a couple bugs with it like any other open source project, but um, you know, it's, it's working well for us. So um, be happy to have you guys give it a try and, and let me know if it's happily working for you too. Um, so you know, just walk through you know, what it does and, and how it works a little bit. Um, the first interaction that any user has with Lipstick is just through the standard out of um, the, the crunch shell, or sorry, the standard error. Um, it'll display a link that says navigate to some crazy link with a UUID to view the progress of your script. And it'll spam that link to the user every time um, pig heartbeats progress. So if you write a lot of pig scripts, you know it's like 1% complete, 2% complete. You know, they'll get, they'll get the lipstick link every time. Um, so if they're to follow that link, they'll get a UI that looks like this. Um, and so there's some interesting pieces to this that I can just walk through. Um, over in the right, there's a listing of the overall job progress for your script. Um, so it's basically you know, what, what we know at a high level about your, what your job, when it started, when it ended, the status of it, um, the individual MapReduce jobs that it compiled down into, and the progress that those MapReduce jobs have um, uh, you know, made it through the script. So this job, um, compiled into five MapReduce jobs that you can see over on the far right there. They're all complete. Um, and so it says 100% map, 100% reduce. Uh, over on the left is a representation of the pig logical plan. Um, and so this is definitely the most visually appealing portion of, of um, the lipstick GUI. And so you can zoom into this a little bit more. Um, each light blue bounding box represents a MapReduce job. And inside of each MapReduce job are um, various logical operations that occur, right? So a logical operation you can think of um, as having just about a one-to-one -one correspondence with a line of pig code. 
Um, and so if you write pig, you know, you'll recognize from the top headers here, um, you know, a lot of pig statement operations. So like for each, group by, limit, um, load store um, are all logical operations. And so, you know, about those logical operators, we'll put any information that's pertinent to those logical operations. So if you're writing a for each loop, right, you're, you're looping through every line of input and doing something to it, likely you're changing the schema of the input. And so we'll, um, we'll, we'll put the schema like in the graph below, below the operation. Um, if you're writing a join, we'll put the um, aliases that you're joining along with the join keys and you know, the join um, expressions that, that you're joining off of. If you're limiting, we'll tell you how many rows you're limiting. If you're grouping, we'll tell you the group key. Um, you know, basically, wh whatever is most important to that um, operation. Um, there's some color coding going on here as well. So anywhere that, that um, the pig GUI shows, or sorry, the lipstick GUI shows orange, um, indicates that an operation is happening on the reduce side. So um, these orange headers here are reduce side operations. Um, blue headers are map side operations. So one thing that's really easy to spot with um, within a lipstick graph is that if you have all blue operations inside a light blue bounding box, it's a map only job, right? Um, and one of the ways that you can use Lipstick to, to optimize your pig is you can kind of fiddle with your logic and the order of execution of things. And you can, you know, well, well, two things. You can try to reduce the number of MapReduce jobs that are, that are generated. And you can try to um, you know, force order of, of execution into getting you more map-only jobs um, instead of jobs that have to, to go through a map in a reduce phase. Um, uh, if, if this had been running in production right now, one of the other things that you'd be seeing is light blue bounding boxes would be flashing either um, the dark blue or the dark orange to indicate that the job is either mapping or reducing. So, um, you know, we demo this a lot at like um, uh, OSS meetups at, at Netflix and I have a little station and it's, you know, running these crazy complex graphs and there's all these things flashing and, you know, it makes people come over and talk to me as kind of like the flame and the moth. But, um, uh, you know, it, it is fun to watch and, um, you know, I've wasted countless hours, you know, just watching people's crazy scripts run in production because it's kind of cool to see them start up and, you know, things changing and numbers incrementing. Um, and speaking of numbers incrementing, one of the cool things that we do is um, in between any job, well, so for any store, any load, and any intermediate output that's generated, will annotate the row counts of um, uh, data that we see flowing through the graph. And so, you know, this, this job loaded 32 million records. It joined it with 99 million records, which is fake because um, it's a data set that I didn't want to give away information about. Um, and it created 30,000 um, rows as output, right? Um, so it's really easy to see that. If the job had currently been running, um, we would have been updating those numbers live as we saw the data flowing through um, PIG just using Hadoop counters to get the information about what it's done. Um, so speaking of Hadoop counters, if you were to click on any of the light blue um, bounding boxes, we would show you um, high level information about the MapReduce job that ran. And kind of the goal here is to keep users in the Lipstick GUI. We don't want them necessarily having to um, link over to the job tracker to figure out more information about their, their job. They should be able to debug it in one place. Um, and so we'll show all the MapReduce counters um, that, that we can get as, long, as well as some other information about the job. So like the, the um, pig aliases that were associated in making the job run um, and some other information about it when it started, when it ended, what the duration is, um, that kind of stuff. So. Um, you know, the, the other benefit of this, and I'll talk a little bit about it um, in the architecture side more, but, um, you know, part of capturing those counters is that we persist them, right? So everything that Lipstick shows you um, is information that it's persisted into a, a RDS store somewhere. So, um, you know, even after that job has been um, archived off the job tracker, it's really easy to still go and call up your Lipstick graph and see what it did. So, um, I guess high level view of, of lipstick, I should ask if there's you know any questions or anything that you'd like me to concentrate on for the rest of the talk um, or not. So I can talk a little bit about how it facilitates um, development running and operations. Um, and you know really, really um, at, at its heart, I wanted lipstick to be a development tool. 
Um, one of the common complaints around Netflix, at least, is that for any kind of MapReduce development, um, iteration is really slow. And so, you know, part of that is, is um, users need to be trained to execute jobs in local mode, and part of that is just so that iteration is slow. Um, and so, you know, a solution to that is to try to reduce iteration as much as possible, right? Like, I, I shouldn't have to um, run my, my pig script 50 times before I deploy it in production to debug it, right? And so being able to um, visualize the workflows and kind of the row counts on top of the, the, the GUI really um, uh, is intended to, to make, you know, iteration faster. And so we do do a couple of um, additional things to, to facilitate that. So um, probably one of the coolest things, I have a screenshot of it um, later on in the deck, but um, we, we sample all the intermediate outputs between MapReduce jobs. And so that's something that um, in Vanilla Pig isn't um, possible to do. Um, if, if you suspect that you know, in between jobs you're getting bogus output, um, Really, you have to rerun your job and you know create a new store command to store out sample data, um, and you know wait wait for that to execute again. So um, you know part of what Pig does, or sorry, Lipstick does, is when it sees a job end, it'll go and kind of um, sample about ten rows of output from um, the sample data set and present it in the GUI to the user um, to look at. Right, and so we found that that really reduces the number of iterations that need to occur to, to develop a script. Um, just because you know, if you can look at, at data several places along your workflow, it's really easy to figure out you know where the heck something went wrong, um, rather than you know it kind of being a needle in a haystack trying to track down what's going on. Um, uh, some other common problems that we see. Um, are omitted hang, like hanging operators. I, I have an example of this in a minute, but um, you know, typic, typically in Pig, you know, one of the things that you're trying to do is um, uh, filter early and often, or do do um, data transforms um, uh, very early in, in your script, right? And so you're writing all of these aliases, like expressing um, a data flow, like load your data, do this to it, do this to it, do this to it. Um, and it, it's really easy to lose track of one of those operations, right? So I have um, A, B, C, and D that should flow in a linear kind of workflow. Um, and I accidentally connect A to B to D, and I forget about C. Um, if, if you can't visualize your workflow, there's a possibility that you'll just never figure that out. I mean, it's not obvious at all. Um, and so Pig, uh, or sorry, Lipstick points that out for you um, in a pretty obvious manner that I'll show in just a little bit. Um, also, you know, a lot of what you're doing, um, a sweet spot for Pig is, is you know, one of the things that um, the, the trainers like to say is that a, a pig can eat anything, right? And so um, a pig can, can eat bad data, a pig can also eat unstructured data. Um, and so a lot of what you're doing is, is typing things and, and hoping that it's, that it's correct, right? And so um, Lipstick helps point out any kind of data type issues that, that you see in your graph um, just through displaying schema at every operation um, uh, and, and making that kind of front and center to the user so that when a data type um, does go bonkers, a lot of times it's a pig bug, sometimes it's a, um, some weird syntax problem that isn't obvious when you're developing. Um, it, it makes it pretty obvious, you know, where you need to go and look to debug that. Um, so for job monitoring, one of the, the biggest pains in the, the ass for me is that, um, you know, pig executes and it'll run, say, a typical pig script runs eight MapReduce jobs, right? Um, if I want to figure out, you know, what, what the heck that, that um, workflow looks like, I have to kind of go and look at the job tracker um, eight, eight different times. And, you know, every output of the job tracker is just this boring black and white table and it all looks the same. Um, I can't really easily infer an ordering to any of the executions of the jobs. And so if I can monitor my job running in one place with, without um, having to click around a lot, um, it makes it really easy for me to keep that straight in my head. Um, when I see that MapReduce 5 um, is 90% complete, I can also see that there's like two more jobs that are gonna execute after that. They're probably gonna execute in parallel and I can kind of think in my head how long that's gonna run for. Um, whereas if I don't have that graphical information, um, really I don't know um, how far my script is along and I'm just kind of guessing. So, um, 
you know, that allows you to spot optimization opportunities at runtime as well if you're monitoring your job in one place. So you're seeing all those input counters like through your joins and things. Um, and one of the, the easiest things you can do to optimize a MapReduce job is to change your um, reduce side joins to be map side joins, right? But you can only do that um, if one of your relations is small enough that you can you know, pin it into memory on all your nodes to join it. Um, and so you know, being able to see your counters that are going into these join jobs, you, know, you can see like, oh, you know, this side only has 1,000 rows at the point where I join it. I can probably make that a map side join. Um, so it makes it really obvious um, when you can optimize like that. Um, it also allows you to see data skew pretty obviously. So um, you know, one of the things that we'll see is that you know, a job will spin up 1,000 reducers, 9,999 of them will, or sorry, 999 of them will um, finish in like 10 seconds and the other one will run for like 10 hours, right? And so um, using a lipstick GUI, you just click on the job, it'll say 99% complete. You've got this one reducer that's been running forever. Um, you can see you know, that it's consumed like a terabyte of data down the one reducer and it's sorting it or something silly. So um, makes that pretty obvious. Um, it also makes it obvious, you know, when things are running long, one of the cool things about PIG is that at every reduce operation, pretty much you can um, control the level of parallelism. And so you can kind of see how you could adjust that to tweak things to run a little bit faster and more efficient. Um, you can also kind of look at, you know, how things are running so that you can tweak your logic to um, compile the DAG in a different way so that things can execute concurrently and you're not blocking workflow at different um, layers of your jobs. Now for support, which is um, where I get called in a lot, you know, I kind of mentioned why I wrote it, right? Um, rather than getting the email, my job is slow, or um, getting like five lines of a stack trace, you know, um, now we've kind of trained our users to just mail a lipstick link to us. And so that gives us everything we need to know. It gives us the picture of the job, um, which is the first thing that I want to look at. Um, my hope is that I can solve their problem just looking at the GUI. Um, uh, but you know, certainly you know, it contains all the information to all of the logs and, and everything that I need to click around and get to. Right? So from an uh, infrastructure kind of support perspective, um, having your users be able to, to mail you a lipstick link instead of, you know, seven links to different um, uh, jobs in the job tracker is definitely beneficial. It makes them happier, makes us happier. Um, and it gives us kind of a common language that we can interface with, right? Like we can say, well, you can see in the lipstick GUI that um, you know, you're casting this thing as a char array and really it should be an int and that's why everything is crapping out. Um, and so it really facilitates good information um, between uh, infrastructure and users. And it also allows users to support themselves. So you know, any big data platform, you know, especially at the, the scale of Netflix, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a mystery what the heck is going on at any given time. Um, and just Netflix is one of those tools that um, facilitates operational transparency. So we always want our users to know um, what their things are doing and, and why. Um, and so a lot of the tools that we write um, visualize that in, in different ways. So we have you know, another service called Sherlock and Watson that um, will, will give you kind of a graphical picture of you know, what, what our capacity is on the cluster and what's going on at any given time. Um, try to compute you know, the percentage of our compute resources that any one user has used over any kind of period, right? Like those kinds of things. Um, uh, I see Lipstick is kind of fulfilling the same class of tools, but at a very much lower level. So at the job level, you can see what your job is doing and why, um, and make smart decisions about it rather than um, not knowing what it's doing and not making decisions at all. So um, a little bit about the architecture of this. I mentioned earlier that everything we write is, is, de is, is as decoupled as possible. Um, and this is no different. Um, there's three pieces to it, and so um, you know, what Lipstick is um, a, is part of PIG is just kind of this drop-in jar that runs alongside vanilla Apache PIG, um, and it implements an interface called PIG Progress Notification Listener that we use to um, serialize our, our plans over to the server um, and, and report progress over to this Lipstick server. So Lipstick server, the little middle piece here, um, is a lightweight Grails app. Basically, all it's responsible for is taking um, plans in progress, persisting them to an RDS, 
um, and serving them to the, any kind of front-end client that talks to the interface. Um, you know, the most, uh, well, well, the piece of, of Lipstick that people interact with is um, mostly the JavaScript client. And so, you know, that's our primary REST um, client into this um, Lipstick server interface. But, you know, there's other tools that we could write against it as well that do cool things. So, um, you know, decoupled into those three pieces, and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, what we're thinking um, at, at each step here. So I mentioned a second ago, um, the, the first piece of it, the, the console piece is what we call it, um, implements this interface called Prig Progress Notification Listener, which allows you to um, plug into various events that occur in PIG. So um, uh, the things that we listen for are new statements to be registered. So if you're in the grunt shell and you type in a new line of code or um, you send a script through um, PIG, it you know, compiles each line together and basically um, creates a new, a new DAG for every line of code that it sees. And so um, we're actually capturing that DAG at each step um, so that we can see how the, how the DAG evolves. Um, and we're able to kind of keep it in its virgin state. So it's, it's this unoptimized um, uh, version of your execution path through PIG. Um, uh, we, we also listen for the event that tells us that a script has actually been launched, com so, so compiled and, and launched onto your Hadoop cluster. Um, and what that tells us is you know, the, the, um, the physical plan for how to run your, your jobs, the MapReduce plans, which I'll explain what these are in a second, but um, basically the MapReduce jobs that are going to be executed um, and an optimized version of that logical um, workflow, which is what PIG is going to actually do with what you wrote. Um, so we also get you know, notification of completion and failure of any kind of job that's executing, um, and heartbeat events that tell us, you know, like, hey, your PIG script made some progress. Your listener can wake up and um, kind of go and scrape information off of, um, off of the job tracker to get you know, those counters that are updating in the GUI in real time. Um, so kind of the magic of Lipstick is that it takes um, these logical query plans and it tries to figure out um, how they map into MapReduce jobs. Um, and honestly, that's the only part of this that's um, really difficult to implement because um, kind of the, the optimization path for PIG is that it'll, it'll um, take your PIG script, it'll compile it into this unoptimized um, version of the workflow that needs to run. So it's just a list of, or not a, not a list, a DAG of um, um, logical operations that are going to execute. Um, and you know it needs to compile that into actual MapReduce code. So as it does that, it'll take your logical query plan, which is your pig script. It'll run a bunch of optimization rules on top of it. So it'll kind of reorder things. It'll um, uh, you know figure out. Um, what, what kinds of filters it can push to your loaders and stores, that, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and so from that optimized logical plan, it'll compile that into a physical plan, which are um, a, a kind of a lower level language that you can use to express the actual MapReduce that's going to happen. And it takes those physical plans, which is another DAG that um, is a little less readable to the, to the end user. Um, and it, it, it compiles physical operations into MapReduce jobs, right? And so at the point of compiling physical operations into MapReduce jobs, you don't necessarily have a link between um, physical operation and logical operation. And so a lot of the um, craziness of Lipstick is that it you know, follows those physical operators and kind of makes an inference as to um, what, what logical operator is responsible for those physical operations and assigns them to MapReduce side of the job um, and a job that executes them. So, um, you know, I talk about the console bit a little bit more than the other pieces because um, that was, well, the part that I've written, but also, um, you know, the, the part that actually touches pig. Um, the server bit is very, very lightweight. We decided to implement it in Grails. Um, uh, kind of covered exactly what it does um, earlier is basically, you know, there's two clients into it. One is the console, which is, um, you know, writing to the server. It's posting. Um, plans and it's basically putting progress um, every time it, it gets an update from pig. Um, and the JavaScript GUI is, is basically the client that's performing all the get operations, right? So um, it's searching, it's searching um, through 
jobs to you know maybe by by um, job name and by by username right to figure out you know jobs that you're interested in seeing and then it's grabbing portions of the object that I sent from the pig side um, to display to the user so um, the JavaScript client is um, the part of that I, uh, of lipstick that I can probably talk about the the least so I'm not um, great at writing um, JavaScript but um, uh, basically, you know, the idea behind um, the JavaScript client is that it's going to take um, a picture of the DAG, which we send from the server in SVG format, um, and it's going to annotate that with information about the heartbeat progress from your job as it runs, right? So, um, you know, we get, um, you know, progress notifications that say, like, you know, we've read 30 million records from this load operation, and um, it's 30% complete, right? And so. You know, it's the JavaScript client that knows when to flash, you know, MapReduce boxes and, you know, annotate row counts on top of the, the, um, the GUI. And so, you know, a lot of that is, is an event-based design, right? So it, it's pulling the server, it's getting this heartbeat progress, it's annotating the picture. Um, but, you know, all through the rest of the interaction with the script, like you click on a, a MapReduce job, um, you zoom in, you zoom out, you switch in between um, plans. It's just listening on user events to um, fire um, things into our back end that render um, back to the view. So um, it is some pretty cool code as well. Um, you know, take, take a look at it um, and have fun. Um, basically, when we were writing the JavaScript client, you know, our key focus is to keep people um, in the GUI for everything that they need to do commonly, um, and also to make it as usable and intuitive as, as possible. So. Um, Kind of the secret around Netflix is, is we rolled out Lipstick for a while. It was running in production. Um, we didn't even tell anybody that we were going to put it on top of Pig. We just kind of set it there. We let them discover that all of a sudden they're getting these crazy links that they can follow, um, and, it, and it shows them Lipstick. So um, you know, we, we tried to make it as intuitive as possible because none of us like to write documentation. Um, and so we actually didn't document how to interact with the GUI until we open sourced it. Um, and at that point, we kind of felt like we had to, to write a wiki and try to get a community around it and make it easy to install and use. So um, th then we actually wrote the documentation. But the goal is that, you know, from an end user's perspective, we wouldn't necessarily have to. They should be able to figure it out. Um, and, you know, for the most part, they, they, they've been able to. So um, I'll just walk through a couple of the ways you can solve problems with Lipstick. Um, and you know, one thing about doing this in PowerPoint is that it, it doesn't look as cool as you know, solving the problem um, in, in the GUI, like nothing's flashing and changing. Um, so I apologize, I actually think it's cooler than the screenshots, but um, anyway. So your, your first problem that, that you see a lot is that your job, you, know, you submit it, um, it says it started, but it doesn't do anything, right? And so you um, look at the lipstick GUI and you know, this is an actual job that really did stall. Um, and it, it's reading this table called VHS Streaming Session F. And so that's um, basically a record of every um, stream that was ever started at Netflix um, throughout, throughout all of history, right? And so you can kind of see it. You know, it looks pretty legit. It's a map-only job. It's only got blue headers, right? It's, it's reading the data, and it's transforming it somehow, right? Um, not super obvious why it's slow. And so, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about optimized and unoptimized versions of, of your query plan and dangling operators. And so this is an example of that. Um, what you're seeing right now is an optimized version of your um, pig script that's going to execute. Um, and you can see up in the top right there, there's kind of a tab that you can click on optimized and unoptimized. So by default, we show you optimized view of your, your graph. Um, but if you click over to unoptimized, you'll see this new operation shows up, and it, it's coded in red, right? And so what red means is I don't know what the heck to assign it to, right? Um, and the reason I don't know what the heck to assign it to is, is because what, what was intended to happen with this pig script is you were intended to load your data, um, filter it for all of the view streams that occurred since um, May 1st, and then do your transform on it. But you forgot about that filter, right? And what happened is you ended up loading every view that ever happened to Netflix, and you're trying to transform it. And um, your job hasn't even started yet because it's trying to transfer, you know, 
hundreds of megabytes of um, partition information from um, the, the metadata server to figure out even where the heck to go to read the data. Um, and so, you know, that, that's a pretty common error. Um, it doesn't just happen on the load side. You know, uh, you, can, you can omit operations all the time and just get kind of bogus, funky results. Like, you know, we used to get emails about, um, you know, my UDF isn't executing, right? Even though, you know, it compiles right, like I've tested it, blah, 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 right? And so, um, you know, before Lipstick, it was a tough one for us too, but, you know, now we know to look and, and half of the time we'll go in and we'll be like, you know, it, it's not executing because you didn't tell it to, right? Like you just forgot to link it up in your DAG. Um, and so, you know, this, it's been a big win for us to be able to visualize that. Um, you know, another kind of problem that we, that we get all the time is that, you know, I didn't get the data I expected to get. Um, and so an example of that is kind of this right here. So uh, this is the picture I was talking about joining 100 million rows to 32 million rows um, and getting 30,000 as your output, right? And so, I mean, you know your data better than um, anybody else, but typically when you're joining millions of rows to millions of rows, um, you would expect a bigger output than 32,000 rows, right? And so, um, you know, you can search through the execution history, see what jobs are, are executing this, what they're doing, um, and when they ran last, for example. So we've got all that metadata. Um, we could do some pretty cool stuff with it. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's one of the things we plan to do or, you know, convince one of you guys here tonight to do. Uh, get back there, yeah. Uh, how do you ensure the security of the data? Like two different users or two different groups, they should not, even if the data set is common, they, how do you ensure that uh, they get access to only the part that they are concerned? Yeah, so the question is um, how do we ensure the security of our, our data sets and graphs? Um, and I'll say I love to work at Netflix um, primarily because um, we don't, we don't, right? Um, and and it is, it's not a concern, and so part of the reason for that is that, you know, every, um, everybody at Netflix, everybody has access to Lipstick, they have access to our Hadoop clusters, they can query any kind of data they want, um, and, and we trust them to, to query only what they should, right? Um, and so, you know, there's two ways that we can allow that. One is we don't store any personally identifiable information um, in, in our... Uh, 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 data warehouse, um, and two is that every employee at Netflix is subject to insider trading rules, right? So I can't trade the stock right now because I'm out of a window because I can see all the data, right? Um, and I really love working in that environment because um, everything is really transparent. So there's there's no secrets from employees, and it lets you make decisions in context. Um, and also as a platform um, engineer, I don't have to worry about things that I don't want to have to worry about, which is you know probably chief among them is authentication and security. So um, that's the, the cheap answer to that one. Um, um, also, you know, we feel that we've uh, left out Hive for too long. Um, and so we, we kind of hacked together um, Lipstick for Hive the, the other night. I'm not ready to commit it yet. I, I might submit it as a pull request so that people can, can use it, but it's, it's still buggy. We're not, um, we're not even actively running it in production, but it, but it works, and it works um, uh, better than I expected it to. So we don't know what to name it either. Um, uh, we're, we're bad at naming things. Um, the, the, the champion right now is, is Honey, but as my boss likes to say, there's a challenger champion model, and, Anybody that can come up with a better name than Honey, which I hope you can, um, uh, can be the one to name it. So uh, this is kind of what it looks like. It's uh, a little less useful than, um, than Pig because we only have access to the plans at certain points. Um, and, and also, you know, it, 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 when I'm running SQL, you're, you're bound to the compiler, right? So it's a little harder for me to tweak um, how things are going to execute and in what order. But you know, certainly it's, it's something that's beneficial to know. Um, it, all the goodness of being able to monitor and see row counts are still there. 
Um, if you used a graphical explain plan for a SQL database, you know that it's valuable, and I mean, this is essentially that. So um, if I zoom in, it, in, in on it a little bit, um, you can see what it's doing. Um, we've got all that map and reduce site information. Uh, there's a bug in the screenshot where we're putting row counts between each operator. We don't actually know that. Um, we just know what it loaded and what it stored, but um, uh, it, it works. So, uh, you know, to wrap up, Lipstick is part of Netflix OSS. Um, you can clone it on GitHub, um, play with it. There's a quick start guide in the wiki that should get you set up in about five minutes to be able to run jobs in local mode and see, you know, what Lipstick gives you. Um, installing it on a cluster is slightly more difficult. I mean, you have to have a Hadoop cluster to run against, for one thing. Um, but it, it's not all that hard. I know that um, uh, quite a few people already have, have been able to get it running. And um, you, know, you have my email on the next slide, and we're happy to help you. We also have a, a Google group that um, people can submit questions to, and I try to you know, answer that as quickly as I can. So. Um, you know, we, we happily welcome any feedback. Um, I've merged a few pull requests from um, other people already. Um, as long as you submit reasonable patches, I will try to get it into um, the trunk of Lipstick as quick as I can and you know, try to make it a, a better tool. I think there's a lot um, that we can do with it. I think there's a lot that can be done with it that I haven't even thought of doing yet. And so um, certainly don't have a, a direction in mind that I won't deviate from if you have a cool idea. So. Uh, help us out. Um, uh, you can look me up on LinkedIn or email me. It's just jmagnuson at netflix.com. Um, I am hiring, um, so if you want to network and um, be hired, like Suji said, um, we can certainly think about that. Um, uh, other teams at Netflix are hiring too, so if, if tools like Lipstick and, and um, and such aren't up your alley, but you're, you're interested in more Hadoop infrastructure level work or, or even something completely different, um, you can talk to me and I can definitely get you in touch with you know, who, who you should be in touch with. So um, thanks a lot. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Oh, one more thing. So I have presents for people. I ordered a thousand of these, <laughs> and I can't get rid of them. Yeah, they're, they're chopsticks. Um, I thought about lying to you and saying they're bacon flavored because then I know you would take one. <laughs> Sadly, I didn't think of it, so they're plain. Uh, uh, unisex, right? Um, everybody needs chopstick. Please come and take a chopstick. Um, I have hundreds of them, so that's that. Um, any, any questions about, you know, it, it doesn't have to be about lipstick, it can be about um, anything Hadoop and Netflix, um, happy to answer. Uh, so the, the question is, um, what is the difference between Uzi and lipstick? And so, you know, Uzi is a, a workflow tool, and so essentially you would um, use it to define a, a chain of, of pig, hive, and Hadoop jobs that are going to run in sequence, right? Whereas um, Lipstick operates at the level of just your job, right? And so they're um, not mutually exclusive. Um, really, you know, the, the Lipstick is there to, to monitor what your job is doing. Uzi is there to execute um, a chain of jobs in sequence and to handle errors and things um, uh, while doing that. So, um, you know, we, we have a scheduling tool at Netflix that we use um, called UC4. Um, which is, yeah, I saw a surprise face. Um, uh, so that's our alternative right now to Uzi. Um, there's there's um, benefits and, and detriments to doing that that I won't talk about um, right now, but happy to talk about offline. Um, and there, there are a couple of, of really cool tools. So like Spotify has recently open sourced something called Luigi, which is an awesome um, workflow manager. Um, so, so is Uzi pretty cool. I mean, it's... it's um, uh, uh, definitely a top contender, you know, um, amongst people that are doing um, workflows in Hadoop. Um, Amazon has an API for doing it. Um, there's Escaban from LinkedIn. So there's a lot of solutions to the to the problem of workflow management. Uh, Julie, there was a mention that Julie can do a dry run. How can you do it? 
Yeah, so there's a couple things that we want to do with it. So we're, um, oh, oh sorry, uh, can you, the, the question is, can you do a dry run to just get a picture of the graph without, um, without executing it? And so the way that I do that right now is I just execute it and then control C out of it really quick, right? And so it won't actually kick off the job, right? Like it'll, I'll, I'll see the uh, little error message that says it sent it over to Lipstick and then I'll control C. You know, obviously that isn't where we want to be. Um, we're working with a, a company who, who's been looking at it called Mortar Data that, that publishes some um, cool um, uh, pig development tools, right? And so they are looking at um, integrating it into something, you know, they're, they're just interested in it. Um, uh, they, they recently open sourced a tool called Watchtower, which is super cool in that um, uh, basically, Pig has this thing called Illustrate that will show you a sample of what your data should look like at each step of the job. And so one thing that I really love to do is have that explain mode that gives me the graph but also incorporates what Watchtower is doing, which is um, annotating like each line of code and each operation with a sample of what the output would look like. So um, you know that's, that's, it's all open source, Watchtower, um, uh, Lipstick. It's something that we'd like to do once we get the time. So. Uh, Oh, sorry, did you have another question? Yeah. You are showing the analytics. If there is a, there are hot spots or those optimizations where we are talking about uh, changing the map reduce to map only job. So your annotations, will they make any recommendations or only like, you know, I have to infer from them? Um, so are you talking about like the what we'd like to do, which is to um, like kind of show warnings or, you yeah, know? Like Right. So, so the question is basically, um, does it does it do any kind of coaching or, or you know yeah. telling you what what you can do to make your script better? Um, right now, it doesn't. Kind of uh, the the way that I think that c should should be implemented is that you know we just have a rules engine that we can plug in that examines the graph um, and you know figures out you know what optimizations that could could, could be made and reports them back to the to the UI. Um, and so. Uh, definitely something that we plan to do, um, but it but it doesn't do it yet. So you know it's up to the user to look at it right now and figure out what they could do better. Um, a, a lot of times it isn't obvious, you know, even even when you see it graphically, what you could do better. And so that's why we want to, you know, just help people along. So. Finally, I have one question. How are you like the sample data which you're getting? How do you get it? And how the percentage is? Oh man! Data? All right, so. <laughs> Uh, the, the sample, the, the question is how are we getting the sample data and, and it's, a, it's a bit of a hack. Um, uh, on the, the physical operators that represent the load in the store, um, they have linked to them the, the function of um, basically the, the store, right, that it used for intermediate outputs, right. Um, and so we do a little introspection, we give ourselves access to the, to the, um, to the function that stores, we, we open its reader. We know the URI that the data was stored at, and we go in and we sample it. So, you know, not something that we're proud of, but you know, the end result we're proud of, and, and that's really all that matters. So, uh, that, that's how we do that. Um, was there a question in the back? Basically, yeah. a lipstick graph inside of um, it, it's a it's an Eclipse plugin, right? No, it's a, it's a Jenkins plugin. Uh, okay, so I haven't seen um, a Jenkins plugin that that does this. Um, you know, there, there are a couple similar tools. So um, uh, Twitter has something called Ambrose that does a similar level of monitoring. Um, I, I can imagine something that you might do in, in Jenkins. Um, really, you know, that, that's precipitated by you running Jenkins against um, no, it's a, it's some kind of. You should do something for Jenkins. I know if, if you're arguing that a graph is a wonderful, helpful thing, Start from them. Yeah, have, have users write the graph instead of writing uh, Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a, a, a long history of um, ETL tools that are graphical development tools. Um, uh, really, there's no, no code in, um, 
lipstick that, that necessarily makes that easy. You know, I'm not starting from them, right? I'm, I'm taking um, the result of, a, of, of a, a plan, which is a DAG, and I'm just visualizing it. Um, we do have a tool that somebody wrote for a hack day at Netflix called Piglets, which allows you to develop graphically these plans. Um, that developed from a tool that, that um, we call HIG, which is basically a compiler for Hive and to PIG. Um, and so you know, we, we, we had to have that in order to um, you know, understand objects and how to glue them together. Um, and so yeah, you can, you can um, draw graphically these PIG scripts, but um, the question is, you know, one, is it PIG anymore, right? Like, you know, there, there's, Netflix is, I mean, even open to debate about this too. We've got users that want a graphical ETL tool and we've got users that, you know, threaten to murder me in my sleep if I, you know, develop it for somebody, right? And, and so, you know, people, some people really want it, you know, because it's how they think. They're used to writing ETL graphically. Um, some people really hate it because, um, you know, they don't want to learn how to use a graphical tool. They want to edit their scripts in VI. Um, and I'll confess I'm that guy, right? But um, you know, I, I certainly see both sides, and I, I don't know the answer to, to doing it. I mean, there's um, pro probably I would start a startup if, if I was developing a graphical ETL tool for Piglet. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Um, so there, there's various schedulers that you can plug into Hadoop that allow, oh, sorry, the, the question is how, how do we just let everybody, or yeah, all of our users run whatever scripts they want. Um, it's really easy to use all the resources on that cluster. Um, and to a certain extent, you know, that, that's absolutely true. It's why we segregate our production workflow from the Wild West kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, it, you know, Hadoop is supposed to be good at that in theory. And so, um, you know, one, one of the things that we, we, we use on that query cluster is a preemptive um, scheduler. And so if, if I have a, a job that needs to be scheduled and you have your job that's using the whole capacity of the cluster, um, my job can actually go and kill some of your tasks so that I can execute and get my fair share, right? Um, and so that's, that's how we get around it. You know, other ways that we get around it at Netflix, um, if a user has, um, a, a specific need that they warn us about a couple hours ahead of time, we'll just spin them up a personal cluster and they can go to town. Um, uh, and, and you know, that's, that's partially an advantage of running in the cloud and that you can just elastically provision you know, nodes from Amazon. Um, but you know, I think the way that you do that in a data center is just a, a fair share scheduler kind of um, model. Maybe one last question. We have a mix of, of all three. Um, a lot of our, well, over 90% of our ETL is written in pig. Um, uh, we, we, I'd say 99% of ad hoc analysis is done in Hive. Um, and then we've got, you know, our, our engineers who aren't, you know, working in BI and, you know, aren't statistician, but they're engineers, like hardcore, they, they'll um, implement things in Java MapReduce. Um, and so we really do, we do get a mix. Um, uh, every tool is good at, you know, a certain thing and, and people use it for what it's good for. Cool, thanks. So that sort of brings up the meetup to the world. Thank you. Very much.